Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk about all news, comics, and media related to the... On this podtacular episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we are joined by Eric Cronover from Steel City Bots as we review Transformers Issue 2. Ultra Magnus was spotted in the trailer for Season 3 of Stranger Things, and we get a look at what the future holds for the live-action Transformers movies. Today is Friday, March 29th, 2019, and this is Episode 122 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that spotted a G1 shockwave in Aliens long before there was an Ultra Magnus in Stranger Things. I'm your host, Charles, <laughs> a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team, which this week is just Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. What's a stranger thing? Let's talk Transformers. It's a, it's a mistransformed Ultra Magnus. Yes, and uh, we are joined again by friend of the show, Eric Crownover. Thanks for coming back. Hello. Good to be here. And you can find Eric on other fine Transformers podcasts like Radio Fee Cybertron and Steel City Bots and uh, Nerdy Geek Talk. Mm-hmm. So thanks for hanging around uh, this week uh, with the with the old. T- thanks for coming to the old folks home, Eric, and, and hanging out with us. <laughs> you know, I love that. That's my kind of lonely here. No matter where I, <laughs> no matter who I'm podcasting with, the gimmick is just that I'm I'm a child and everyone else is old. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, you can't argue with facts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we, as always, we'll start off the show by thanking our Donatrions, those beautiful people who give us money on Patreon and PayPal. You guys are awesome. And we really appreciate your support. Uh, if you want to join that the ranks of our Donatrons, if you're not already a member, just go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support, and that's where you can sign up. Uh, also, uh, if you want to buy some merchandise from us, you can go to transmissionspodcast.com slash shop and get some cool Transmissions-themed T-shirts on our T Public store. And if you buy anything from T Public through our link, we give us a little bonus, so... It's another way to help out the show. All right, let's get right into it and talk about some comics news. All right, first up, uh, we've got a comic in the Bumblebee uh, Blu-ray DVD that'll be out in a couple weeks on, uh, or uh, just a week, uh, April 2nd, or less than a week, actually, (laughs) when the show goes up. Uh, So... This comic is called uh, Sect- Bumblebee Sector 7 Adventures, and there's some preview images that show Bumblebee fighting Soundwave and his cassettes on Earth. So uh, that's cool. Uh, what is you got Rumble? Laser be- Rumble's so He's weird. He's just a robot. He's cool, <laughs> but it's like, it's weird. I don't know. It's like they mashed up several different random Maybots. I do dig how Laserbeak is like a mix of Dark of the Moon, like his wings look like the Dark of the Moon Laserbeak, mixed with like the G1 body. Mm-hmm. Neat. Also, why is Soundwave an old man calling Bumblebee like kid? <laughs> he literally, he calls him son at one point. It's now canon I don't that know. Bumblebee is Soundwave's son. <laughs> <laughs> They, you're reading a little bit too much into that. No, nope, Soundwave said it. It is canon. It's how it works, right? But yeah, so this is a uh, so you're you're going to get a physical comic book with the DVD release, and it's there's a motion comic on the DVD as well. So that's cool. Um, so this makes me more excited to get the Bumblebee Blu-ray. Nice. Which version is it? Do like what version comes with the comic? The comic uh, version. I, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I meant like it's exclusive to a store or something. Oh, because I, I know I there's always it... a, there's a billion different versions of you know the movie whenever it comes out on Blu-ray and stuff. Yeah, it it doesn't say uh, what version it's it's like. Uh, hopefully, it's with all of them. <laughs> that I, that would I be would ideal. That, yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't say if it's exclusive to one or the other, uh, like the 4K, the Blu-ray, or yeah. the DVD, or a store exclusive. 
I think it, if it was a store exclusive, it would say it. Yeah, but, it would definitely so. say it. So it's probably just whatever specific format that it's... Yeah. Oh, well, we'll find out on April 2nd. <laughs> yes, we will. All right, uh, moving on, uh, Viz Media announces that they are putting out a Transformers, a visual history art book. Uh, so this is going to be written by Jim Sorensen, well-known uh, Transformers uh, book writer, archiver person who's who's done lots of uh, Transformers books in the fans. He's done, he's a... Uh, uh, you know, I'd say he's a pretty big fan and known in the fan community. Uh, this is going to be this book is going to be 408 pages wow. and it's going to be an a regular hardcover that will be fifty dollars. And then a deluxe limited edition with a collector's box and five exclusive art prints for a hundred dollars. And this is scheduled for November 12th, 2019. Uh so if you are big into Transformers art, uh, it says there's going to be rare and iconic images from Hasbro's archives uh, and as well as development art from Paramount Studios feature films. So, Eric, that might be up your alley. Yeah, I'm <laughs> actually pretty interested in this. I, I, yeah. I want to see those exclusive movie pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next, uh, we have some news about Death's Head, the return of Death's Head. Marvel has announced that at C2E2 uh, last week, where Jeremy was, uh, Marvel announced that uh, they're doing a new Death's Head series. It's going to be written by Teeny Howard and art by Kei Zama, well-known Transformers fan or Transformers artist Kei Zama. I'm sure she's a fan, too. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, don't hold for lot... that title. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, Transformers artist is actually above Transformers fan, she so you can, know it's she, it's she, she's earned both. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed in the news article. It doesn't say like it, when it gives her previous credit, it says Scarlet Witch instead of Transformers. So no, that's what Aww. she did for Marvel. I was gonna say it's more relevant, but. Doesn't mean yeah. I don't want to see Transformers credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or I should say Optimus Prime, I guess. That's the series she worked yeah. on. Uh, but yeah, so that's cool. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, also uh, in this new Death's Head uh, comic, the f issue one cover is going to be done by Nick Roche. Yeah. Uh, who also in this article is mentioned as being worked has worked on Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows because that's the most important thing he's worked on in his comic career. Well, he did a Death Set comic um, too. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> I am a little disappointed they didn't go back to Simon Furman for you know re resurrecting Death's Head, but. I'm just surprised that they resurrected Death's Head. That's my yeah. Uh, this, yeah. this blows my mind. <laughs> I, I, out of all the announcements Marvel could have made, this is like the bottom of the list that I ever would have guessed. Yeah, <laughs> and it and it warranted a panel. <laughs> oh my God. I'm I, but I'm so happy. It's it's the best surprise ever. Mm-hmm. And I guess I should. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't read for, far enough in the article. At the the last sentence of the article does mention that Kazama is best known for her work on Transformers, Optimus Prime. Oh, see, so, there you go. Good job. You got all. Ma you got writer. all mad for nothing. <laughs> so apolo apologies to Multiversity Comics where we had this news story. All right, I got to speed this up, or we're never going to get through all mode. <laughs> Uh, next, we have uh, some more uh, uh, some more preview art from the uh, upcoming Transformers Ghostbusters crossover. Uh, editor at IDW Tom Waltz has just been posting a bunch of uh, teaser images. Uh, the latest one on Twitter is uh, an image of the Ghostbusters discovering Starscream's ghost in uh, on Earth. It looks like they're on Earth, so in, in the middle of a field. So, uh, yeah. I can't imagine the Ghostbusters wacky. going to space. Well, they're gonna, aren't they? Because aren't they on the cover? Or, like, aren't they on Cybertron in the cover? Mm, I don't 
I've we've seen Gozer on Cybertron, but not the Ghostbusters. Oh, okay. We'll see. Maybe. I mean, I think that's that's the least outrageous thing. I was just going to say, I was like, they catch ghosts. Is space travel really? Is it really that improbable? I mean, if I could ground this idea in reality for a, a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> it's why <laughs> See, I was going to say that's a, that's a pretty big if don't the Ghostbusters aren't they concerned with like you know first and foremost New York and then second of all like you know Earth and, and humankind you know if a ghost is 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 you know messing around in, in you know space or let's just you know let's let's say the moon let's it's a little closer <laughs> <laughs> Do they do they really care all that much? It's out of their jurisdiction. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah, it's not their problem. You're not that's, our problem. That's not. That's right. It's 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 too too big of an issue to 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 bust for them. They can't bust it. They need to call in some some Cybertronians. Oh, new one. Oh, there you go. All right. Well, uh, speaking of uh, the. Transformers Ghostbusters crossover that brings us to the Transformers <laughs> comic solicitations for June 2019 uh, and first up is issue number one of that Transformers Ghostbusters crossover and it's been canceled <laughs> no I'm <sorry>. uh... <laughs> no it has not it is still coming no this is honestly one of the most exciting things I'm looking forward to right now yeah <laughs> it looks so goofy and fun <laughs> yep uh, also in uh, June will be Transformers number seven and eight of the new series. So we're moving right along. You know, we'll, we'll be four months in and have eight issues under our belt. Hopefully, if yeah, we'll, Diamond we'll uh, realistically gets all six. <laughs> Sounds all right. We fully expect them to be two issues behind by June. <laughs> We'll see. I'm crossing my fingers, but at least uh, they 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 got issue two out this week, so they're on schedule so far. But we'll see. All right, uh, that's all the comics news. Uh, so let's move on to our comic review. Okay, so this week we are reviewing Transformers number two, The World in Your Eyes, part two, written by Brian Ruckley. Art by Angel Hernandez, pages 1 to 16, and Cache Whitman, pages 17 to 20. Colors by Joanna LaFuente, pages 1 to 16, and by Josh Burcham, pages 17 to 20. Letters by Tom B. Long. Editors David Marriott and Tom Waltz. Uh, we have a bunch of covers. Uh, the first one, uh, cover A by... Nelson Daniel, it's a nice picture of Chromia doing her investigative work. Um, cover B by Ron Joseph, art by Ron Joseph, colors by Thomas Deere. And it's uh, Megatron rallying the crowd. Uh, I think it's before he becomes a Decepticon, even though he still has his fusion cannon. But uh, it's a nice image. I like that uh, very uh, classic uh, G1-ish Megatron. Uh, the Retailer Incentive cover by Jeffrey Vereggi, I think. It's a, like a poster advertising Cybertron daily departures, like a, you know, a shot from space of so spaceships uh, coming to and from Cybertron. And uh, oh, it's an advertisement for Primus Air, I should say. And uh, the, uh, we have a Retailer Exclusive cover from Sad Lemon Comics. And this is art by John Gallagher. And it's a nice picture of a sound wave. It's a very cool like sound wave on a ruined cityscape with uh, his uh, cassettes, Ravage, uh, Rumble, and Laserbeak. Or Frenzy. I should say Frumble, I guess. And uh, yeah, it's a nice little, uh, a more gritty image, I guess I'd just say. So, uh, Eric, which of these four covers are do you like the most? Uh, definitely the Soundwave cover, and not because of Soundwave, but because they did a toy-accurate Ravage, so he has massive biceps and thighs. And who doesn't want a <laughs> Ravage with massive biceps and thighs and then skinny little legs underneath? It's fantastic. <laughs> no, but the, the, the Soundwave image itself, joking aside, does look super, super cool, so that one is definitely my favorite. I, 
the background and the super cool sound wave and his little cassettes. Also, is nice. Bumblebee dead under his foot? Uh, will be alike, I guess. It certainly looks that way. Yeah. If he's not dead, he's not in good shape. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Daryl, which cover do you like? Um, I am going to place my vote for the Ron Joseph one with uh, Thomas Deere on colors, the Megatron rallying the uh, the the populace. Um, it, it's got a lot of life to it. It's the the facial expression on on Megatron is showing, you know, uh, a lot of uh, expression and that he's you know he's really into what he's saying and, and and that kind of stuff and then obviously the crowd around him is is pretty cool too uh i just i like that one quite a bit <clears throat> um not to take anything away from from the uh the one that uh eric picked but i do want to point out that jeremy will have picked the uh primus air one by jeffrey Vareg. uh that's a mm-hmm. that's a definite jeremy uh, cover right there, if there ever was one. <laughs> it's kind of boring. That's Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, it's Jeremy likes the uh, he likes the idea of it being. I think he likes it being like a uh, like an ad, a minimalist. I think is what his his deal is. So he he's kind of into the minimalist <laughs> pictures. So yeah. What about you, Charles? Well, uh, yeah, Daryl, I'm gonna agree with you. I like the Ron Joseph and Thomas Deere cover. That's a um, that's a really cool image, and I, I like that Megatron. That's a really nicely drawn Megatron there, mm-hmm. and uh, I like the like the just you know the detail on the crowd, like the generic crowd bots are are nicely well drawn too, nicely rendered there. Mm-hmm. So I like that. I do like the generic bots. That was my favorite part of that cover. Is definitely like looking at the bodies of the Decepticons he's rallying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ascenticons, not Decepticons oh, yeah. yet. Oh. <laughs> <I'm bad>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get into the story. At the remote Energon power station, newly forged Cybertronian Rubble faces a hard truth. The world is more dangerous than he or his mentor Bumblebee ever realized. Rubble has become the first bot to witness a murder on Cybertron in Megacycles. Bumblebee, still in shock, and Windblade have called in security team Chromia and Prowl to investigate the crime scene. Prowl suggests Brainstorm's death could have been an accident. Maybe the Rise tried to sabotage the station. Brainstorm caught them, and they overreacted. Chromia is skeptical, but if the Rise is responsible, she'll see them brought to justice. Chromia turns to Rubble to ask if he's okay. She reassures him that this tragedy is an anomaly. Cybertron really is a peaceful place. Chromia turns to Bumblebee and asks if he can take Rubble back to the city and do another activity to keep them occupied and take their minds off this terrible event. Bumblebee says he can take Rubble to visit Wheeljack's construction facility. Chromia agrees that's a good idea, but she warns Bumblebee and Rubble not to talk to anyone about what they've seen. Mumbly agrees, and they take Chromia's hover transport carrier and fly back to the city. After they're gone, Chromia continues the investigation. She asks Windblade if Rubble might have had something to do with it. Windblade is taken aback and exclaims she's sure he's innocent. Chromia assures her she's just being thorough. Since Rubble did discover the body alone, she asks to ask the question. Chromia continues to get Windblade's story, and she reiterates that the only thing they saw between Icon and the Energon station was a Voin scavenger. Prowl interjects, did she check on the Voin? Was it licensed for this zone? Windblade answers, no, she didn't bother checking. She's in security, not Xeno relations. Prowl answers back that she was investigating a report of, of possible sabotage, so she should have done her due diligence. Windblade reacts negatively to his second guessing. Chromia interrupts before the confrontation escalates and orders Prowl to get the other transport carrier ready for the body. As he walks off, Windblade grumbles about Prowl's line of questioning. Chromia commiserates with her, but tells her Prowl's attention to detail makes him the best investigator they have, even if his personality pisses off everyone around him. 
Chromia remarks that it's been so long since anyone on Cybertron was murdered, more than half of Cybertron's population has never experienced it. This could cause panic unless they figure out what happened and bring those responsible to justice quickly. Chromia calls Orion Pax via Holocom and gives her the, and gives her report. No updates on the situation. Orion Pax understands, but he's got more pressing concerns at the moment. Megatron's Ascenticon rally in Tarn is going forward, and the audience is growing larger than anticipated. He asks Chromia to get more security in place just in case. Chromia answers that they're already stretched pretty thin, but Orion just asks her to get anyone they can spare to Tarn. At Iacon, Bumblebee and Rubble have made it back to the city. Bumblebee is still reeling from the shocking murder of Brainstorm and reminds Rubble not to discuss it with anyone. Rubble promises to keep quiet as they go to meet Wheeljack. Wheeljack greets Rubble and Bumblebee warmly, very excited to introduce Rubble to the wonders of construction engineering. Wheeljack is particularly enthusiastic about the crowning achievement of Cybertronian technology, converting the planet's moon into the greatest Energon harvester in the universe. Termagax designed it, and 2,000 Cybertronians worked for Kilocycles to bring her vision to fruition. As Wheeljack is going on and on, Rubble notices a small object on Wheeljack's foot. Wheeljack looks down and picks up a small organic slug-like creature. He mentions it's a skitter from the Aeovian home planet. They stowed away on some Aeovan refugee ships and are now thriving in the Cybertronian environment. They're harmless little creatures, so they let them stay on Cybertron. But now it's time for Wheeljack to put Rubble to work. Bumblebee leaves them to it, and Rubble gets an up-close experience of all aspects of construction work, with Wheeljack as his enthusiastic guide. Sometime later, Bumblebee returns to collect his mentee. He asks how they're doing, and Wheeljack is excited to report he's back just in time to catch the moon unfolding to do a full cycle of Energon harvesting. Wheeljack encourages them them to get a good view from the roof of the nearby parts store and see the sights. Bumblebee takes Rubble up to the roof, and they lay back to watch the night sky. Rubble asks about the details of the Energon harvesting process, but that's not Bumblebee's area of expertise. Brainstorm would have known more about it, but that thought reminds Bumblebee of his terrible fate. They sit quietly for a few more moments. Then Rubble asks Bumblebee, what's the rise? Bumblebee goes into a rant about all the political factions on Cybertron. Autobots, Ascenticons, the extremists of the Rise, uh, Primals, Reversionists, etc. He cautions Rubble to stay away from all of them. Bumblebee never joined any of them, and Rubble doesn't need to either. Finally, Bumblebee says there are better, more wondrous things to pay attention to on Cybertron, like their moon transforming into a giant Energon Harvester. They watch in awe as the panels of the surface of the moon open up and it begins to do its work. Rubble is blown away. It's the most amazing thing he's ever seen in his young life. Bumblebee, significantly older, agrees. Meanwhile, in Tarn, the Ascenticon rally is in full swing. Megatron addresses the crowd, complaining about the status quo on Cybertron. Cybertronians are unique, gifted with advantages and abilities beyond that of any other species in the galaxy. Why are they constrained and limited on their entire planet? Why do they have to ration Energon and wait kilocycles between forging new Cybertronians? Megatron continues that Termagax, founder of the Ascenticons, knew that they had to rise up and throw off their self-imposed constraints. They have to take control back from the Autobots, who are too invested in the status quo. As Megatron's speech intensifies, a sniper from a building above fires a blast at the podium, causing a panic. Megatron is enraged. Who would dare to fire on him? He tells the crowd of Ascenticons to get to cover as he goes to the source of the blast. He angrily crashes into the, per- into the perch, but the would-be assassin is gone. Megatron vows to find the culprit and make them answer for this. To be continued. So, all right. Uh, I think uh, issue two... I, <laughs> Unfortunately, I think this needed a bit more action. This was very much a, uh, you know, let's continue with the, uh, you know, filling out the exposition a little bit, making, getting, uh, you know, having the the murder investigation go on a little bit. And then, you know, getting to know Rubble 
and and Bumblebee. Um, I think all those pieces are are you know they're they're good ingredients here in the comic, but the whole comic just kind of didn't work for me. Um, I you know I I I'm I like where the story's going, but I think in this single issue we didn't the story didn't move forward enough for me. Um I think also uh for the most part I like the art, but I did notice that uh in like uh, in a lot of the panels that like we in the further away shots we have you know a lot of a lot less detail and you know comparing that to the more detailed art that we got from uh you know from previous Transformers artists uh, I prefer that style. Uh, I mean, I, th- I think it was a pretty much a stylistic choice about like having when you have wider shots, you you reduce the detail a bit. Uh, and maybe it's also a consequence of trying to 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 stay to this, uh, you know, the biweekly pace or, or you know, for the comic. But uh, I I prefer more detail on the art. Uh, I thought the coloring was really well done. I think uh, all the scenes were, uh, you know, were very vibrant, both the nighttime scenes, the daytime scenes, uh, or I guess it was mostly all nighttime and and then some indoors. But uh, yeah, that's that's where I am on this comic. So I'm still looking forward to the next issue, but I wish there was more in this issue. So uh, Eric, uh no, could you uh, maybe maybe before you talk about this issue, what did, what did you think of the first issue and uh, and where the new series is going so far? I think that it's it's interesting, but I'm still looking forward to like the actual beginning. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm I, I'm more looking forward to where it leads rather than where it is right now for both the first mm-hmm. issue and this one. Uh I I like the art. I don't know if I like it as much as the previous Transformers comics, but, like, it's not bad by any means. Like, I definitely still like it. But, like, overall with this, mm-hmm. I think I think with both the first issue and this one, it's just, I'm, I'm satisfied, but I'm not blown away, and I'm mainly just looking forward to, like, what's to come. So, yeah. Yeah, but this issue specifically, poor Rubble. Just, just <laughs> sad. Poor little rubble dude. I totally agree with you though. This issue is so boring to me at least. <laughs> it's not it's not bad either. It's just because it's it's all like there it's it's pretty much necessary. It's boring for the sake of future issues, I think. So like I understand why this happened, but it's still like, man, this is a pretty I, I think this issue is boring. Like I, I just I'm like looking for extra details in the background and stuff because I'm just like there is so little going on that's exciting that I, I need to find something else and you know but I I understand why but yeah I kind of like the relationship between Bumblebee and Rubble but I also feel like Bumblebee's a weird mentor. <laughs> It's like, I don't know, because I still think that he seems less experienced in stuff compared to the others. So it's just like, your mentor is the least experienced one? That seems odd, but, you know. I do like them, though. I think I, I, I did like them just, like, uh, you know, looking up into the sky and talking and stuff. Like, I thought that seemed genuine. But again, mm-hmm. it's harder for me to appreciate that when the whole issue is kind of slow and boring. It it really needed something to pick it up other than, you know, like the last page. Yeah. Yeah, I, w- I would have liked to... I mean, even I would have liked to have a little bit more time spent with the Ascenticons. Like, we, we, we get a tantalizing picture of Soundwave just standing there in the background. Uh-huh. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, it's like, um, uh, that Simpsons episode where they go to, um, to Camp Krusty and the, and the, the counselors bring out the fake Krusty. They're like, here's Krusty, but he won't be saying anything or doing anything. <laughs> he's just, he's just standing there. <laughs> He doesn't even move until the spot he's standing in blows up and he just falls backwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, yeah. So I, I would, yeah. I mean, maybe if we if we had gotten a little bit more with the proto Decepticons or you know just something else going on, 
Uh, I mean, I do appreciate that we're trying to establish these new characters like these. I mean, they're all essentially new characters for the new series. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, have them do a little bit more, I guess. All right, Daryl, I imagine your thoughts are going to be similar lines along similar lines here. Yeah, um, I tend to read the books uh, before I go to bed, and I fell asleep reading this book. Um, <laughs> so it's it's not exciting at all. Um, and I actually I fell asleep in the middle of the you know let's talk while we lie on the roof uh, moment. So um, it the art is if they keep it the same then it's it kind of sticks with being a different you know continuity for me if they start to bring in the old the old uh artists um then then it kind of starts to you i want to expect more out of it i'm looking at the lines and the 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 line work on these on the art is very thick and i, I keep i see like little bits where it kind of like certain lines go through where they should, you know, where they, where their stopping point. And I want to say that this looks like it's done a hundred percent digitally. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. so, uh, I can see where, where, you know, there's, there'd be benefits to it being done on paper, like, um, a old school way. And then, there, there's kind of some negatives to being done 100% digitally. Um, as far as the story goes, yeah, it was super boring. Uh, not a lot happened. The exciting part with the Ascenicons, um, I'm looking at it right now again, and Megatron's getting all getting everyone riled up, um, and then the shot comes out and blows up the stage. Okay, first shot explodes mm-hmm. the stage. Then two shots hit him in the arm, and they go ting tang. I'm like, <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was funny. What like, gun is this guy using? Where you know, or what is he made of that you know he can take the shots, right? And if he can take the shot that explodes a stage, what the hell is this guy thinking? That taking is taking the shot at him. You better get a better gun, dude. Because this is junk. <laughs> you you got you're doing nothing to this guy. I don't know. I, I saw that and I'm thinking, this is either this is not thought out or it's really thought out and it's going to pay off later. So, but um, I just I found that kind of funny to look at. Well, may, maybe it, maybe the the sniper had like had a missile launcher that's like a like it takes a while to reload so he fires the one missile but he missed mm. and then he just pulls out a pistol and starts shooting the pistol right. to stop Megatron from getting to I him I still love that just gunfire on Megatron is just like tink tink mm-hmm. <laughs> no matter what gun it is just stop like oh that's cute mm-hmm. <laughs> the panel with him coming through the wall is probably the best panel in the whole book um mm-hmm and that's very actiony, and, and it looks really great. Um, if I wanted to really get nitpicky, I could pick away at it and even find problems with this particular panel. Um, but um, all in all, I, I, the I myself am the 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 guy who wants action, action all the time. I don't care about the story, but I I'm still in the mode where. I got to give it to this, you know, Ruckley and the team to kind of sauce out the the story here and 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 mm-hmm. build the foundation to for it, you know. I want to hear what's happening in the world that they want to live in and and that kind of stuff. So with that said, I'm still okay with this second book being as it is. Mm-hmm. If it makes the payoff better, then I think it's worth it. But then again, it it builds it it adds more to what you expect the payoff to be, because yeah. you know you 
you say, okay, well, you've you spent all this time. We know the first uh, arc is five issues, so you've spent the first two. We don't know what's happening in three, but we've spent the, this much time building. The end of this arc is coming. You better pay it off. Um, and and if it doesn't pay off, then subsequent arcs are going to be less and less, you know, expected of, and and you know we won't want to, you know, talk about them as much or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So mm-hmm. anyway, it's I'm still fine with it. They're still building. Um, I personally want more. I got to give them time. Yeah, I mean, I, and I do like I, I do like the little the little bits of lore he is sprinkling in. To this issue like uh in the conversation with rubble and bumblebee and they talk about the different factions so you know that you get some tantalizing details here i mean beyond the ascenticons and autobots we've got primals and reversionists so i'm curious what what those are uh we've got this the rise which is some kind of extremist terrorist group or something mm-hmm. uh, we've got chromia and prowl as a as like a cop duo which is interesting and and prowl is not in charge so mm-hmm. that's interesting like uh prowl is not the master manipulator here he's just kind of an asshole but he's a good cop <laughs> yeah and he is usually like he is almost always the alpha in any kind of you know situation and here he's he's a subordinate yep and uh, i we did we do get a, a brief uh cameo of gears in the construction facility like working that. with wheeljack yeah he's so cute so <laughs> And I guess is that gears truck mode there when that that rubble is loading up? It looks I like guess. it. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it cuz the transformation looks like his head there, so. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, those are those are all nice little uh, uh little easter eggs here. But yeah, I I am I am waiting for some uh, uh some action or at least, you know, some stronger story beats. So. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, then then also the other thing. Uh, so looks like Autobot. The Autobots are not uh, like a. I mean, maybe they're just a ruling faction, but it looks like the bots on the ground are not really affiliated with the Autobots. I mean, Bumblebee in particular, he's not. He's not an Autobot. He's not anything. He's like, don't even bother. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. He's not Optimus Prime or Orion Pax's little buddy here. <laughs> All right, well, uh, that is our review of Transformers number two, and uh, hopefully we'll get Transformers number three in two weeks and uh, take the story a little further. So that was Transformers number two, and let's move on to some Transformers media news. All right, in media news this week, uh, we have, once again, a lot of stuff from the Bumblebee movie. It's like it's you know, come out again in the theater? Oh yeah, wait, it has. In Japan. Uh, the Bumblebee movie has just finally come out in Japan, and we're getting a whole bunch of new stuff uh, about, uh, you know, releases and special screenings and uh, the Japanese voice cast, which is, you know, cool to see them getting a nice shout-out. Um, plus, we're also getting... Uh, ex, uh, clips and stuff because the D- DVD Blu-ray you know special releases of the movie are actually coming out in physical form you know here in you know the rest of the world so we're getting you know teases as to what's going to be on those discs and whatnot here so the Japanese audience is getting the movie finally we're getting it released in the stores so it's uh, it's a pretty uh, crazy time for the, the movie again the- the digital release is already out, it's, so we, yeah. I think so. A lot of the ex, the uh, the deleted scenes are on the digital release already too. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I'm probably not going to go through all of these, but I want to uh, I want to highlight a couple of them. Um, the um, the Japanese voice cast they attended a special screening. Uh, because, like I said, it has started to come out, or just came out in Japan. So they're all very excited for it. Expect to see some of the international numbers for it go up um, because of uh, the Japanese audience getting to see it. Um, there's a new anime anime clip for the Bumblebee movie. Um, there's a featurette here. Uh, one of the links uh, that we have is all of the deleted scenes and featurettes. Um, so you can take a look at those. One of the deleted scenes uh, 
is Charlie and Mimo um, in the in Bumblebee as they drive. I think it's they're driving to the cliff where she first uh, kind of, you know, is there, where all the rest of her like classmates and stuff are around. And Mimo has a thought as to what Bumblebee actually is. And uh, you can take a look at that there. And uh, there's some more deleted scenes in here if you want to take a look. Um, one about uh, the kitchen bots. I so, love that one. So you can take a look at that. Um, do you think that one should have been left in? I think it's borderline too goofy, so I'm not mad that they took it out, but I would have loved it still if it had been in the movie. Mm-hmm. I'm it glad. is pretty goofy though. So. Oh yeah, no, I'm glad that they uh, they kept it as a deleted scene for the the special release though. Now on to the main topic here of the uh, media news segment, we have some info for future movies, and this is basically what has Lorenzo de Bonaventura said this week. He's gone on to say a couple of things. Uh, let's start off with topic number one: Bumblebee two is going to have a little bit more Bayham. Uh, so he has actually referred to it as Bayham. And Michael Bay, Mayhem, yeah, you get it. Now, let that percolate for a bit while we move on to the next one here. He's also said the future direction of the uh, the movies, he he basically wants he wants two movies here. He wants he wants to produce a sequel to Transformers the Last Night where he wants to complete the the story arc with Unicron. Yeah, the horn sticking out of the sand on, in the desert. That's Unicron. Uh if you didn't know, there you go. Um and they're working on a Bumblebee 2 uh, which is two different universes from what we are understanding as of right now. This doesn't make a lot of sense. It's very confusing to people that are not within the fandom and following this as closely as we are. But, yeah, so it's a mess. And he's basically the most recent one is saying that the main, the next main Transformers movie is a reboot. Now, I think I'm just going to pass this over to Eric, who is just going to run down Lorenzo, and we're going to gonna pile on and, and, and kind of trash this, because it's a... Uh, it's a mess. Yeah, so so first off, the Bayhem thing. He is such an idiot for using that word, because he isn't talking about Bayhem. Bayhem is a combination of action, excessive explosions, inappropriate humor, all that kind of stuff. It's a bunch of things. What he is talking about putting in the Bumblebee sequel is not Bayhem. He's talking about just a couple more action scenes. Okay. I don't know why he thought it was smart to use the word Bayhem. I guess because it would make a great headline, which, hey, it did. Uh, mm -hmm. Because he got everyone all riled up, when really they shouldn't be, because he's not talking about actual Bayhem. He's literally just talking about an extra action scene or two, which makes sense, because the first one with Bumblebee, you know, it laid, up, it laid down the foundation of the characterization and everything. They put in all the work. It makes sense that they have room for a little bit more action in the sequel. That's just kind of logical. Right, but of then course. He, yeah, but then he went and used that word and made everybody mad. So, ah, he's, <laughs> he's so smart. Then when it comes to... So, like, I feel his word, basically, is super unreliable unless you're talking about a yes or no question. His opinion is terrible and should not be listened to for basically all these interviews. The only thing that I would really trust are the facts that there are two movie scripts in development. There's no reason he'd be wrong about that because that is his job. He's a producer. So that makes sense that he would know that, that there is a sequel to Bumblebee, which is supposedly having uh, Bumblebee and Optimus teaming up, which, yeah, that makes sense. Sounds right. And then the other script, which is confusing because it's supposedly a sequel to The Last Night, but it's also a reboot. So... All we know is that it's, it's, I don't know. All we know is that he doesn't know what it is. My guess is that it's a soft reboot or like it's, I don't know though. The way he talks about it is confusing. I think that he doesn't know what the word reboot means, which he's actually stated that in an interview, 
where he also said Bumblebee is not a reboot. He said, I don't know. I don't even know what the word reboot means. Not even kidding. That is in an interview. Go check it. Mm -hmm. Um, So whenever he says that Transformers, the sequel to The Last Knight, is a reboot, I don't trust him. I think he means it's like a fresh start or something like that, just like the Bumblebee movie is, because why else would you toss in the words sequel to The Last Knight? Like, I feel like that's very specific, and that's a that's a studio decision, like whether or not to abandon this. There would be no mistake as to whether or not this thing is a sequel to The Last Knight. Now, whether they deal with the Unicron thread or drop it since he says he doesn't like it, but then again, I don't care what he likes or doesn't like. Uh, that doesn't really have to do with what gets made or not. He's not that powerful. I, I, I think that it will be a sequel in the main series. Like, I think it will be Transformers 6, but... I think it could be basically a soft-ish reboot, sort of like how Bumblebee was, where they maybe tweak the designs, although I would assume not quite as much as Bumblebee, the movie did, uh, and then obviously change around the way they do the story and stuff like that, which, hey, I'm okay with, but I'm I'm kind of hopeful at this point that we could get a Transformers 6, and that it could actually be something that everyone likes, because... I like Bumblebee a lot, and I really do. I it, it made me sad that it seemed like the main series of Transformers films was going to die after the last night. Uh, because I really do, like, I like that universe, and I would like to see it end. Even, even if it doesn't continue on forever, I would just like to see it actually end. Not the way the last night is very much not an end. Uh, so I'm hopeful, but still skeptical about Transformers 6. Bumblebee 2 being... Uh, a follow-up with Bumblebee and Prime, that's obvious, that makes sense, there's no reason to doubt that. Transformers 6, I think, my guess is that the new Transformers main film will be 6, whether or not it's actually called 6, but it will follow The Last Night, whether that be loosely or not. Uh, but who knows at this point? Mm-hmm. I I mean, so, one thing I will say is that at least looking at the the way these the interview has been uh transcribed on the page it seems like the questioner kept referring to the next trans movie transformers movie as a sequel to the last night and that de bonaventura didn't like he didn't correct him but he also didn't say didn't start with those words so i mean there's some wiggle room there i believe he called it a sequel I, I believe I saw another interview because he's done so freaking many uh, <laughs> yeah. where he himself called it that, but I would need to check that. But I, I do want to yeah. say that he, I think that's why the reporter said that is because he said it on a separate occasion. Okay. Well, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I think, I guess, uh, you know, er, Eric, I, I have a, of course I have a different perspective. I am, I am not interested in seeing a, a sequel to the last night. I mean, I, that, the um i mean the thing the thing that that kind of uh already uh makes me bothers me about the uh, the live action movies is that they don't even like from one movie to the next they don't even respect their own continuity so why should i care if they continue their continuity you know to the next movie so i'd be i'd be perfectly happy with a completely fresh reboot i i'd actually prefer that um i think they always like they seem to just set up plot points in a movie in one movie and then completely drop them in the next movie. Like case in point is age of extinction. Everything they set up in age of extinction, they completely threw away in the last night. So, I mean, like you had, you had no explanation for, uh, Megatron being Megatron again. You had no explanation for where the mini Dinobots came from. You had no explanation about the whole, mythology with the creators doing stuff on prehistoric earth all that stuff just you know was never followed up on i mean mm-hmm. so i so i think i i think they don't respect their their lore enough in the movies so why should i respect it <laughs> and um you know so i'd be happy with a reboot but i'm also i mm-hmm. i'm aware that uh they will probably try to capitalize on kind of stra- straddling those two, uh, you know, those two. Yeah, they want to get the money ends from of the spectrum. Both. Yeah, they've learned from yeah. Bumblebee. It's like, oh man, we can make money doing both of these things. So you know what? Right. Let's just do both. 
but I guess we'll see. I mean, it's going to be a little, it's going to be a little while before the next movie. Mm -hmm. So I guess we'll just wait and see. That's true. And that's it for media news. All right. Uh, let's uh, move on to some transforming pop culture. All right, uh, two uh, two little items here. First up, there's a contest to win an Xbox One X, Bumblebee themed Xbox One X. Uh, you can uh, do this uh, through social media. It's uh, um, it's been announced on the Bumblebee Movie Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, you have until April second to enter this contest. Uh, you have to be an Xbox Live account holder, 18 years of old, 18 years of age or older. So, Eric, you just squeaked under the bar there. Uh, <laughs> actually, I don't know if you have an Xbox Live account. So. I do, actually. <laughs> okay, good. So you got to follow Xbox on Twitter. You got to retweet uh, the Bumblebee sweepstakes uh, post that they put up, and it's linked in the article here. Uh, and if you do all that, you will be in the contest and five winners will get an Xbox One X custom Bumblebee Xbox One X. Um, I am entered. I hope I win. <laughs> yeah, that's a... it, but... <laughs> well, definitely let us know if you do. We want to we want to uh, bask in your in the glory of your of your winnings here. Yeah, so as a time when this episode goes up, you've still got time to enter, so uh head over to Twitter and get those entries in. All right. Uh next, uh so this is uh what we referred to in the intro. So they just released the trailer for Stranger Things, uh season 3 Stranger Things that is coming this summer. And in this trailer, you can see a G1 Ultra Magnus in one of the scenes. Because uh, this is set in the 80s, so, uh, you know, lots of 80s references. And, yeah, uh, whoever put this G1 Ultra Magnus in, in the shots here is not a Transformers fan, because they do not know how to transform G1 Ultra Magnus. No, his missiles are on top of the shoulders. The shoulders are stuffed <laughs> down through the arms. And I think they added, like, a, a remote control car part to the back to make it remote controlled. Yeah, it's very weird. Yeah, but hey, mm. it's Ultra Magnus, so that's cool. I mean, at, at least they did, like, put, I guess, the cab in the Magnus armor. <laughs> I, guess, I guess there's that. But. Oh, also, I did check, and I found out that Lorenzo, at one point, did say, before all the reboot stuff, I, and I quote, one is the latest in the main family series following the events of Transformers The Last Night, and the other is a sequel to Bumblebee. So he said it, his own words, too, before, well. and then contradicted himself. So just wanted to clarify, <laughs> I went back and found that. It was uh, over uh, just over a week ago that he said that. Hmm. All right. Well, you, you do you, Lorenzo. You do you. <laughs> he clearly is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's uh, that's all the transforming pop culture. I guess when Stranger Things season three comes out, we'll be looking for. Hopefully, there'll be maybe there's a little bit more Transformers references in, in there somewhere. I guess we'll see. All right. Uh, so let's move on to some convention news. We mentioned this in the toy show, but I just want to mention again that TFCon Toronto tickets are on sale. So TFCon Toronto is this July 12th through 14th. Uh, the tickets are on sale. Also, the hotel is, blog is up for reservation. So if you go to tfcon.ca slash tickets and tfcon.ca slash hotel, uh, you can uh, get your stuff and uh, you will hopefully see all of us there. Yep, yeah, I'm excited definitely see all of us there <laughs> <laughs> all right a little bit uh so actually this weekend uh at wondercon uh idw is there so this this weekend right now as you're listening to this podcast idw is at wondercon this is in uh anaheim 
and uh, they've got lots of stuff. They've got signings. IDW artists and writers are there. So on Friday, uh, this fr- today, I guess, when this podcast goes up, uh, we've got Transformers writers, John Barber, Margaret Scott, artists EJ Sue and Livio Ramondelli. So they are all there signing books. Uh, so that's between 5 and 6 p.m. on Friday of the con. And then Saturday... Uh, March 30th, 2 to 3 p.m., we've got John Barber and EJ Sue uh, at the um, signing stuff. So this is at the IDW booth. Uh, then on, um, uh, we've got some panels that IDW is doing. So Friday, 2 to 3 p.m., it's IDW's 20th anniversary celebration with hosted by IDW Editor-in-Chief John Barber and former Transformers writer. So hopefully there'll be some Transformers announcements in there somewhere, maybe. Um, and then we've got a uh, on Saturday from eleven thirty to twelve eleven thirty a.m. to twelve thirty p.m. We've got a fully Transformers panel. It's Hasbro and IDW present the Transformers panel. So this is all about the new Transformers comic series. It's um, hosted by Tr- John Barber and editor David Marriott. Uh, and they're going to celebrate the 35th anniversary of Transformers as well. So, so uh, hopefully we're, we're looking forward to seeing lots of uh, lots of information uh, this weekend out of Transformers. If anyone is at WonderCon, uh, you know, hit, hit us up. Tell us what you saw there. If you if you caught the IDW panels, yeah. So there's there's lot, IDW's doing lots more stuff there. Um, but that's all the Transformers related stuff. But we'll link in the show notes. You can see all the IDW panels. Uh, they also have a bunch of convention exclusive uh, variant covers. Uh, in particular, a Transformers number one cover by EJ Sue uh, that features Optimus uh, or Orion Pax, I should say, Megatron and Chromia on the cover. And yeah, I think that's the only Transformers cover, but lots of other covers there too. So check that out. All at WonderCon this weekend. All right, well, that's it for convention news, and that'll do it for this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next time. Uh, Also want to thank Eric again, Eric Crownover, for joining us this week, helping us out. Thanks, Eric. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And again, tell everyone where they can find you on the Internet. Uh, you can find me a couple places, uh, Radio Free Cybertron, also uh, my own younger generation of Transformers podcasters. Uh, we have our show Steel City Bots, which you can find by searching Nerdy Heat Talk, wherever you listen to pretty much this podcast, I, I guess. Big layover. Uh, so you can search that. Also, Eric Crownover on YouTube, if you want to hear me rant about uh, Lorenzo's Transformers announcements as they go on. So... Yeah, definitely, definitely check all those out. All right, and uh, bye, everybody. Have a good week. Later. See ya. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Transmissions. But just because this episode is over doesn't mean the Transformers fun has to stop. Join us and other Transformers fans on our Discord chat server by visiting transmissionspodcast.com slash discord. If you would like to learn more about how you could support the Transmissions Podcast, just visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Yeah, I am extra adult. (laughs) It just means I'm I'm old. (laughs) Not more mature. (laughs) All right. This is you, Daryl. Yeah, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry I'm not fast enough for you.